everyone how's it going welcome to the know your gear qa podcast live episode 314 and uh i have no actual idea what episode we're on uh when i was typing 314 i was looking and i'm like uh i'm pretty sure it's 314 if it's not like i said last week uh just you know we'll go with it <laughs> i think once we hit 300 episodes i just started going all right this is a lot of damn episodes all right so um, hold on real quick. I am. Um, sometimes I have a bunch of screens up and one of them is the, what you guys see. I see a little version of what you guys see of me and the closed captions on. And it's really tough to talk when you see the closed caption, trying to figure out what I'm saying as I'm saying it. It's a little, I don't know if you've ever, yeah, deal with that. It's really strange. Anyways, uh, what are we going to talk about today? We're probably talking about guitar stuff. I think that's probably going to be the best, best idea, uh, for the week. And, um, talk about some cool stuff. We have some early riser questions. We have some super chats. We have some questions that were sent in during the week. Um, we have a lot of subjects and guitar, uh, talk to talk about. And first let's, before we get started, as always, I just wanted you to point out that if you see somebody's name in blue with a blue wrench, it means they're a moderator. They're here to help you, uh, with some issues or questions you might have that I can't see. And also if you see somebody in green, uh, it means that they're a member, a channel member on YouTube. We, we now have like 109, channel members, which is a lot of channel members. Um, we have 400 patron members. And so, uh, I want to thank you guys for that. Both. I've get this question a lot. Which one is more beneficial to the channel? Look, both have a benefit to the channel. YouTube really likes to see the channel members cause they get a big chunk of that. You, uh, patron gives the channel more dollars. We get, we get like 80% or 85% of the money that you get from Patreon. Uh, approximately, I, 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 they say they take about five to 10%. I feel, it feels like it's more like 10 to 15% where YouTube takes about 30 something to 40%. It's pretty hefty, but it all benefits. And I appreciate it all. So again, this is sponsored by you guys. That's why I, I point that out because it's great. Um, we don't have to, uh, we don't have to shop sponsors every month or every year. It's been you guys since, uh, 300 and apparently 14 episodes. <laughs> So, uh, anyways, uh, so hopefully we'll get 314 likes while we're, while we're live. Okay. Let's, let's just start talking some guitar stuff. Uh, the first uh, question I saw came in early was, uh, scroll was from three J music. Who's a channel member who says, Hey, Phil, I'm sure this has been asked before expensive guitar or cheap and cheap amp or vice versa. This is a question I find that, and there's a little bit more, but I just like this question. I have been, if there was a question, it's not that on, I get asked this all on, on the show. If there's a question that comes up when you're at a, maybe a pub <laughs> talking to fellow guitar players, whether they're professional guitar players or they're just a bunch of hobbyists like us or whatever it is, uh, you know, it comes up like that's a real question. The guitar players ask. It's one of the few questions that I think translates from beginner guitar player all the way to pro line guitar player. It's like, what do you find? Because at the core of that question, it's when you're picking your tools, what are the most important tool? What is the most important tools of the tool set to have? Right. I, I kind of picture in my head, you know, you know, other, other type of, of, uh, trades, uh, discussing this in the same kind of vein, right? What's more important to you, you know, your wrench set or your screwdriver set, right? These are, these are the things. So, uh, we'll and I'll give you the answer to that question. And of course, what's great is I think over the, what's nice over the years is sometimes my answers change as I change, as things change. Um, let's see. And so he has a caveat. He says, and does the answer change when it comes to live or recording? And for me, the answer is no, it doesn't change. So to me, expensive guitar or, and cheap amp or vice versa. And look, I want to, I'm going to say the answer to that, but I also want to say, when I say expensive, I'm saying good. And when I say cheap, I'm saying not so good. Uh, you know, the fact that it's something you can great, get great gear that's inexpensive and you can get bad gear that's expensive. So I don't want it to come across. Like if I say, if you buy an expensive thing and a cheap thing, you know, one will be guaranteed good and one will be guaranteed bad. It's not, it's not that easy but I'm going to assume that in the expensive versus cheap comparison, we're really focusing on what's more important to me. What's more important to me by far is the guitar. And I've had this uh, question and debate with many friends and some, not so much my friends, <laughs> but, but people I, I talk to and we, we hang out. Um, 
uh, you know, kind of cohorts, if you will. Well, um, anyways, and, uh, you know, it is, it is a divisive question because a lot of players will say, look, um, in fact, I think my buddy Joe is a hundred percent like the amp matters. I think that's why I remember his answer. One time we were debating this, like the amp, the sound, where the sound come from matters the most. Here's my problem. And, and this is why I don't even know in the past, I might've answered this differently, but let me tell you something now that is, uh, something I really don't like to answer a cop to, but I've heard for years that it's not the guitar, it's the player. And as someone who reviews guitars and plays them and demonstrates them in video after video after video, one of the things I've learned is that the guitar absolutely dictates how good I play because it's almost like, it's not almost, it's like this. Every time I review a guitar that I, it, it, I feel like it's fighting me and I'm not really, it's not really my thing. And, and that's what happens when you review guitar. See, when you start a channel, it really starts out with you just sharing the stuff you like with people and that's, that's okay. But after time, people kind of like your opinion or like to see what you think of things. And then what they want to see, what the viewership wants to see is you do the thing that you guys like. You guys don't want me to review another Fender Strat that I like. You want me to review, you know, a Rickenbacker or a, the Firebird or something else that you guys are interested in, right? Or maybe a Les Paul or whatever, something that I'm not as interested in as to play. And what I've learned over time is, man, when I play guitar and I demo, you guys will say, I get it all the time. Sometimes you know, someone will say in a video, man, Phil, your playing's really improved. And then in the next one, Somebody's like, yeah, this guy's not very good at playing. And I can tell you 100% of the time, no ex ex no exceptions, that when I get compliments about my playing, it was always because the guitar was just a dream to play. It was so easy for me to play. The action was perfect. Everything was great. Everything, the stars lined up and I just could play effortlessly. And I work it, so you guys know. Sometimes I have to work. Uh, when a guitar is fighting me, in other words, it's not the quality of the guitar. It's just it's me and the guitar not jiving, and I'm still, you know, trying to review it and give you guys some sound samples. Sometimes, uh, you know, my poor wife has to listen to this. I can record two hours of stuff just to clip the three, four minutes that you guys will see because I'm just everything is not landing right for me. I'm fighting it too much. It doesn't feel intuitive. I don't like the way it reacts. It doesn't sustain long enough for me. I'm real big on the sustain. So you know, um. Uh, if a guitar does not sustain on its own very well, it's like, I don't have it in me to hold that sustain where you could give a great pro level guitar player and they could probably hold that note for an hour. Me, it's like, if the guitar is not working with me or for me, it is working against me. Um, you know, so the saying like the, you know, it's not the, it's the driver, it's not the car. It does not apply to me. Apparently the gear is, is extremely important to me. Now, here's what's funny about that. The amp sounding like crap doesn't seem to affect me in the video very much at all. Like if the amp's not doing a tone I can handle or something, it's as long as the guitar, in fact, um, if in fact, here's what's interesting. In most of the videos that I do, if you were to go through the comments and see where the most compliments I get about my playing, nine out of 10 times, it's I'm demonstrating the pedal or the amp and not the guitar that you're, and you're like, man, your playing has improved so much since last I heard you, right? Or, oh, it's gotten better or whatever. Or oh, that's really good. Well, it's because I bring the guitar that I like to play into that video and I can play that guitar. And I, and I found that if I stick that guitar into a cheap and expensive amp, if I plug it into a, a pedal, I'm not really digging at all, just trying to get the demonstration out or the review out. Or if I plug it into the most amazing amp ever in history that I love, I feel like I'm fine. It's just, it's just, like I said, it's like I can, I can approximate in my mind what it's supposed to be doing the amp. So if I play a note on an amp and I feel like the amp's not doing anything for me, I'll just go, well, yeah, uh, I'll just, you know, the guitar's moving, it's, it's, it's fluid and it's working great. So for me, it absolutely, the guitar is everything to me. Um, I would rather, in fact, to get, show you how extreme this is, if you gave me a choice between a guitar, a, not a cheap guitar, because I don't want to say that word, because I have some inexpensive guitars that are fantastic. A good guitar versus a bad guitar, you know, uh, right, versus an amp. Not only will I pick the guitar, but I would pick the guitar at the detriment of you not even having an amp. If you told me, like, if I had a good guitar, but I couldn't have an amp, I'd have to plug straight into, like, a mixing console, <laughs> right, or into a thing, a no, no amp or nothing, I would, that's what I would pick. So, um, and I can tell, and, and so, so you guys know, uh, 
it's so important to me that I sometimes play electric guitar without an amp all the time. Just to sit there and play the electric guitar like you would acoustically. And to me, it's singing and it's doing what it does. And and um, I've actually had this experience too. I, 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 I'll be at a music store and I'll be playing a, um, you know, guitar and I'm just not, I don't like, I don't like it. And they'll say, Hey, you want to plug that in? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and I think they think I'm, you know, like they take a tent, take offense to it. Like I'm taking, a, you know, like I don't want to plug the, amp, I don't want the amp or whatever. It's just, I'm already can tell. I don't like the guitar. If I don't love the guitar without the amp, I'm not going to level with the amp. And the, you could be the exact opposite of that. In fact, a lot of you are, that's fine. It's what works for you. Again, like I always say, you know, the, the gear is not for the, uh, for the audience. It's for the artist. It's for you. If that's what I, uh, what matters to me when I was in uh, Germany and I played in that, uh, that Guinness book of World record thing where we all played for two hours in front of all those people. Um, I didn't even care about the amp. They, uh, we used, uh, some Hughes and Kittner amps that sounded pretty good. And everybody was like, here's all the settings you got there. Hughes and Kittner was trying to help us, you know, dial in. And I was like, I, I just need some basic sounds. I just, to me, it was all about the guitar. As long as the guitar, you know, and plus also, uh, in that instance, I was learning a lot of new songs that I didn't know and trying to remember them. And again, the last thing I want is the guitar in my way. So for me, the action, the strings, everything matters to me. I'm, I, I thought, I thought over all these years, you know, hundreds of videos demonstrating guitars playing as much as I do now, because I play mount now more, way more than I ever did in the past. And I played good amount in the past too. I thought all the things that would, you know, I imagined I would change like, you know, I'd like, you know, I'd, I'd be able to play anything now, pick up any guitar and just start playing it. And actually, if anything, I think I'm getting worse. I think I'm getting more like I have to have exactly the guitar I like with the action exactly like I like it with. The, the strings, the exact gauge I need, you know, everything has to be the same. Uh, it has to be the way I like it. Otherwise I have trouble and I fight it and I don't enjoy that very much. <laughs> so, um, so there you go. The, um, I was playing two of my Les Pauls today and funny enough, one of them immediately, I was playing it after a minute or two and I don't know what it is. I don't know what it was. It's been a while since I played it, but the action, not the action, it was so easy to bend the strings that I immediately hated it as subtle and silly as that is. I was just like, this is too bendy. <laughs> I, I just, I put it down and I picked up the LS Paul and I felt like the tension on that was better. So I could have made some adjustments, but that's the, I guess the benefit of having two guitars. You can just go to another guitar. So definitely for me, the long answer, but it's the, it's the guitar over the amp. Um, Okay. Uh, John says, Hey, Phil, what are your thoughts on guitar centers? 10% off a new purchase. If you trade something in seems to be worth trading some pedals, uh, that I don't need. Yeah. I'm that guy that still shops at guitar center. Nah, there's nothing wrong with shipping, shopping at guitar center. Like I said, I have, I have a lot of complaints about guitar center, but it's not necessarily that I don't like guitar center. I don't critique things that I don't like. If that makes any sense. If I have no interest in it at all, I don't critique it because I don't care. I don't even want to talk about it. Guitar Center, when I have issue, when I talk about Guitar Center, it's because I like Guitar Center and I hate how sometimes it's operating or how it's working now because it's, 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 I want to give them my money or more of it, right? Just like I want to give, you know, other businesses more of my money if I can. Um, so let's talk about this. So Guitar Center is offering 10% off if you, uh, so in other words, if you trade some piece of gear and doesn't matter what it is, trade it in, you can put it towards 10% off towards only new gear. So I, I already know, I don't begrudge that. That's a, that's a smart, smart idea, um, because used gear flips fast and, um, and they want to get rid of new gear. Let's face it right now the the market is still moving, uh, pretty well. Um, so you guys know, I was looking at a per pretty expensive piece of gear this week and I was, uh, you know, doing the, old, I don't know if I should buy this. And, um, I did it over three, four days and every single day that whatever I was looking at, the thing I was looking at, it sold and they were out every time, every day I'd find another dealer and they were out and they were out. So, I mean, people are still buying stuff, but, um, so it's a great idea. Get rid of some new gear, get some used gear that definitely is going to get more excitement. Let's face it. That's why we go in those stores. That's why you go to mom and pop stores. That's what you go to physical stores for anymore at this time. You're pretty much going to find random used gear that you may or may not know you liked. Um, what I'm curious about is what am I curious about? Let's do this. Okay. Uh, 
you know, this is where I said, uh, where I'm saying, here it is. Um, I like Guitar Center, but I also, like I said, I also, there's things I don't like about Guitar Center. So we are going to share this together. There you go. That's my screen. So you guys see it. This is the Y Trader cell with us. Okay. I'm looking, I'm looking and, ah, plus save 10% on something new. So what, how I found this, if you guys know, is I typed in Guitar Center trade for new and then uh, and then Google found this for me on their webpage. This is the, on guitarcenter.com's website page. What I'm curious about is the Guitar Center, the Guitar Center effect. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what I mean is nothing can be easy with Guitar Center, it's too corporate. So let's, let's just check I, before I praise the idea, because I love the idea of, like I said, bring us some used gear that everybody wants, get some of this new gear out of here that we're overstocked on. It's a good business move, especially in retail. And if you can get an extra 10% off, you know, right, that's great. Plus, remember, when you trade in your gear, um, let's say you trade in a $100 pedal. Let's say they give you $100 for a pedal and you buy a new piece of gear for $200. Not, not only will you get 10% off the new piece of gear, but you'll only pay sales tax on the money you spend, not the trade, okay? If that's confusing for anybody, I'll just make sure you understand. If you go to Guitar Center and you trade in a piece of gear and they give you uh, $100, you know, in trade value, and you were to find something for $100 exactly, even if it's $100 plus tax, just $100 exactly, and purchase that, as long as there's no, as long as you're not giving them any physical money, you would not pay sales tax. The person who buys your used piece of gear from them will get sales tax. So um, so not only are you getting 10% off when you trade and use a piece of gear to get new piece of gear, you're not paying sales tax on whatever the value of your trade is. So if your value of your trade is like I said, so if you trade something for two, three hundred dollars and you find a new piece of gear for three hundred dollars, not only are you gonna get 10% off, you're gonna get sell no sales tax. So you understand essentially, like where I live, that's 18% off, right? That's no sales tax plus the 10%. That is ex uh now, so you guys know I'm not in every single state, I'm only in Arizona, and I can tell you most states are gonna be like this. But if you go to some place and it's not like that, there's could be different laws and different rules and things change all the time, but that's supposed to be how it works. But of course, companies find ways to do weird stuff. So back to Guitar Center. So it says here, when you trade in your used vintage gear, oh, okay, uh, you get it for a trade credit. Okay, view exclusions and limitations below, we will. <laughs> Due to our legal restrictions, cash payment is not available at these stores. Uh, okay. Um, how it works. Okay. Basically you bring in your gear, right? You get paid and you save 10% on something new. Okay, cool. Let's go to the exclusions. Okay. Exclusion limitations and, and discount offer $500 maximum discount. Okay. That's fair. I mean, think about that. That's, I mean, 10% for to get $500 to be 10% off something for $500 is a lot of money. So I understand that not to be used in conjunction with other coupons, promotions, and offers. That's finally no cash value. Okay. They have to do that legal excludes already discounted and clearance items. That makes sense. They're not, you know, they don't want you to trade for their blowout stuff and take 10% off price matches used. Okay. They're not going to price match stuff, which fine. They're usually the better price anyways. Uh, shipping charges, scratch and dent gift cards, right? <laughs> that makes sense. None of this. Okay. And products from the following manufacturer exclude. This is where guitar center. So I just want to say this. They're got, they have to put this out there because of the map policies. The question is, will they hold to this in the store? Okay. So, um, so what I'm telling you is basically, if you look here, uh, D'Angelico, I'm just going to read some guitar brands, EVH, Fender, Fender custom shop, Ernie ball, Epiphone, <laughs> right? Uh, Friedman, full tone, Galleon Kruger, Gibson, uh, you know, go to Godin, uh, golden age, uh, Keeley, Kemper, Korg, Kramer, right? <laughs> Randall, Rain, Rocket Pedals, Roland. Uh, obviously, Boss has got him in there too. Alvarez, Ampeg. These are all excluded. So in other words, you can trade in your piece of gear and get 10% off towards a new piece of gear. But apparently, every brand you've ever heard of has opted to be excluded. The reason why I say that is that's the downfall of that deal. So it's like a, it's, it's not a bait switch so much as it is kind of, but it's like a, kind of a stupid, stupid policy. But what I'm telling you is this, that is true. I just read it. So that's the thing. What I can tell you is that when you're in the store physically and you try to do it, they may not adhere to that. In other words, they may let you buy, let's say, obviously it said EVH was excluded. You might be able to go, Hey, you know, I want to trade this pedal in. 
buy this new piece of EVH gear and they'll just go, okay, no problem. Um, because it's, again, they don't want to violate the map. They're not allowed to say they're discounting 10% off to any of the brands, right? Those brands all basically have a map policy, which is a minimum advertised policy. And they're saying that, but, but on the other hand, I could be totally incorrect in that because things change all the time and you could go in there and they go, yeah, great. You can get 10% off. Thanks for the trade in value. You get 10% off anything on these walls, as long as it's nothing on these walls, except for Mitchell. Right. Right. So yeah, house brands not excluded. So basically what I'm saying is, is that it's a possibility that that is, uh, if you're going to go down there, um, just be prepared. There is a potential. You could go down there with your pedal, trade it in, wait the 30, 40 minutes it takes for them to figure out what the value of your pedal is. They give you the value. You spend another 30, 40 minutes to an hour picking out a new piece of gear just to walk up to the counter and being told that they're not going to do that deal. That is a thing. So reason why I'm telling you all this is I would ask them before you spend that time. If you're going to go down tomorrow, Saturday at the local guitar center, your local guitar center, trade in some gear and buy a new piece of gear. When you walk up to the counter, specifically bring up what I just mentioned and say, Hey, look, I want to trade in a piece of gear and I want to buy a new piece of gear. Are we going to have a problem if I pick in pretty much any major brand at all? And they'll tell you up front, like, no. And they might say what I just said. Yeah, we have to say that publicly that, you know, that's the map thing. Oh, and, but no, we can make that happen. Or they might hardline you and go, yeah, if it's in excluded brands, it doesn't work. And then you might as well just walk out and leave right then. Because unless you're going to get a Mitchell or one of the three brands that probably weren't mentioned there, um, <laughs> walk out. So that's my answer to you guys. Uh, seems like a great idea. I like Guitar Center doing this. I like uh, Guitar Center should do the things that obviously we want other, other companies can't do, which is uh, interact us within a store and improve the store experience. But um, that's just my my thoughts. Obviously, I think they should also work on their internet. But at this point, I don't think they can catch up to the to the guys that are killing it on the internet. And so might as well work on what they can, what they have, what advantage they have, which is you can walk in and do some trade deals and they're pretty good. It's one of the downfalls with Sweetwater uh, and their used gear thing. And I've talked about this is that there's a couple things that happen the way Sweetwater does the trade for, cause the fact that you sell stuff on the gear page for Sweetwater, you sell your gear and you take the um, gift card option. Yes, they don't charge you fees. That's great. However, because you chose a gift card, and not an actual product, you will now pay the sales tax when you buy the product with that gift card. See, that's the downfall. And I brought that up to Sweetwater. We talked about it. And uh, honestly, they just couldn't see a workaround when it, in fact, they weren't even, I, the person, the people I talked to weren't even sure what I was talking about. They were like, what are you talking about? Cause they weren't retail savvy. You know, I was owned a store. And so I was like, no, no, you understand. That's like the benefit to trading a gear in a store is you don't pay sales tax. The person who buys the thing you trade will pay the sales tax. They don't collect sales tax twice. So, um, so that's one of the downfalls of the way Sweetwater has to orchestrate it, but physically, I don't know how they could get away with any other way than they're doing it. So that's the advantage to Guitar Center. Like I said, when we talk about this stuff, I always want to be fair handed with every company. Like no company is perfect and no, you know, so, I mean, this is the stuff. Yeah, Karen uh, says, hey, can you trade for cables and strings? I'm sure. Look, uh, yeah, absolutely. Like, like I said, I just, again, I think personally, uh, if I think personally, when you go to trade in some stuff at Guitar Center, I think you're going to get whatever you want as long as this new product. It's just, you know, you're going to have to either A, I just, before I would waste my time, <laughs> I would ask me before. It's like I said, I wouldn't want to find out at the end. Because it's, again, it's, you know, who wants to give up a couple couple hours of your time just to find out it's not going to work out for you. So that's my suggestion. Um, Grumpy My Guitar says, hey, I just got an offer of Reverb for $100 off a guitar I've been wanting to get. You know, I, uh, I did a test with Reverb the last two weeks. I literally clicked, I watched, which now they don't call it watch anymore. Now they call it favorites, right? Right. I don't know if you guys saw that. It changed. It used to, I swear it used to say watch. Uh, and now it says items wa I'm watching. Now it says favorites. Anyways, I watched a ton of things on reverb, uh, amps and guitars, anything I was kind of interested, use new. And I mean, even kind of just to see what happened. And man, was I shocked. Oh, I would say, you know, I can't, I don't know. I didn't count. I should have counted, but oh, 90% easy. Nine out of 10 of the things I watched sent me an offer. <laughs> 
So that tells you where the market is. It's a little soft, right? It's not, again, things are moving, but man. Um, so, you know, I actually bought a guitar um, and I'm going to be getting rid of a couple of guitars. I bought a guitar for me personally. This isn't for the channel or anything. I, I don't even know if I'll review it, but I'll show it on. I was thinking about guitars that I buy that I'm not really interested in reviewing. I just want it personally. Maybe I'll share them on the, the channel here on the live show. Share it. So when it comes in, I'll share it. But um, what was great about it was I they were not accepting offers or anything. And I reached out to the store and I said, hey, would you do 10% off? Not only did they do the 10% off, but we were able to uh, buy. I was able to buy direct from them. Uh, instead of using any kind of other, uh, you know, entity and I save the tax too. So that's 18% off. That's a pretty good deal. 18% off, not the just tax out the door. I was looking at 10%, like that's a little better than tax out the door, but 10% off plus the 8%. It, it, it may not sound like a big deal. Some people are always like, is it always about the deals? It's not about the deals. But in this case, if I couldn't come up with, the, if I couldn't work something like that out, I could not buy that guitar. It's again, it was just too stretched a little bit too on the budget on my side. So I had to come up with something to make it make sense to me to, to justify this. And that's with selling some guitars to buy it too. Um, yeah. Yara says not a great time to be trying to sell things. It's well, I mean, it's not a horrible time, but yeah, I mean, come on. Uh, and ER, you're not wrong, but I'm just saying like the COVID thing, we should never, the COVID bubble, whatever you want to call it, the guitar bubble, we should be cautious to not, factor that is being like the norm. Okay. Guitar selling used for top dollar in five minutes is not the norm. And it should never be. I really feel like now if I was to sit, if I was to look at the market, the guitar market now and say, where is it at? It's where it was in 2019 before this all, before the, you know, all the guitar boom started seem it's a lot slower now there's a, but it's not slower than it was in 2019. The one thing that throws it off is things have changed. So for instance, like people aren't as buying amps as much as they were. I mean, it's obvious to see amp sales are being, you know, hurt, uh, hurt a little bit. Pedal sales are a little bit down more so than normal. Um, but again, not hurting just down because again, trends, you know, there's trends and the trend is not right now. It's like a lot of people are really starting to lean into modeling units. And, um, and I think that's because I obviously, uh, as some of the modeling units become more affordable and more people are trying it for a ton of reasons. So, so yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a bad market to sell. Um, like I said, if it takes just a little bit longer to sell, then who cares? You know, at least it's still selling. It's just like, yeah, I mean, during COVID, I remember one day we listed, I think like eight or 10 things and we sold them all in two hours. <laughs> And I remember we were sh in shock because I thought I had a couple days, like I was going to start, like get some boxes and sh and I was like, all of a sudden I'm like, we got to get boxes. we got to ship this stuff out. Like I was in shock and that's the beginning of the bubble. That's basically when we didn't, no one had any idea stuff was moving like that. So, so yeah, so I don't know if it's uh, necessarily bad. It's just not what it, it's not that boom again. It's not the boom. Um, what else? Okay, we have Unfreaking Believable says, Hey, happy Friday, Phil. Any, uh, he's a moderator, by the way. Unfreaking Believable, thank you for being a moderator. Any idea on as to when the Badlands Town Hall will be? So that was a discussion. So, so I think the Badlands thing, the Town Hall was really kind of my idea. I said, Hey, we should kind of do this. And I just don't know if it was ever going to happen. Um, like I said, I suggested it because I just like the concept of, Hey, we should all meet and hang out. Um, I have a Zoom account that allows me to have 100 people on it. And obviously there's 50 customers. So I was like, okay, this can kind of work. And I think the problem is, is that there's just all the people that are involved in the project, just lining up those schedules didn't seem to make sense. I don't know. I haven't heard much. All I can tell you, so I can only tell you, cause I, I only deal with certain things, right? You gotta understand, like I said, I have certain things that I do. Um, one of the things I can tell you is I will be in California in a little over a week. And I mean, barely like in the next week, um, to, and I, my understanding, <laughs> cause I, I get a schedule, um, presented to me about everything I do every day. Right. And, um, so the, on the schedule is, uh, I'm going to, uh, to California and to inspect 25 of the guitars. That is my understanding. So, uh, and so there you go. Um, so, uh, I think 25 of you are about to get a guitar. <laughs> so my guess would be the first 25, but I don't know. It could be, it could be, I don't know how it was, it was deemed. I would imagine first in first out, but I'm sure 
if they're, you know, if, uh, cause the guitars are all kind of tracked to the certain people that bought them, there might be reasons why if yours was a little earlier, but yours, you get yours in the second batch, not the first batch. And I also believe I'm supposed to be back in the beginning of June for the second 25 ship out to go through them. So there you go. That's what I'm, that's what I know. Um, let's, uh, let's see. Oh, I can tell you though, uh, 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 Chris, um, if you contact Badlands through the contact, um, there's always somebody there that always uh, will be able to answer the question better than me because <laughs> I tend to only focus on the things I'm responsible for. And then the things I'm not responsible for, I just kind of let that go, you know, get done. Uh, I can tell you the things like other uh, things I'm responsible. I was helped out with is, uh, I have 20, no 25. I have 50 red DiMaggio straps downstairs in a box. I have 50 hex hider keys in the box downstairs and I have 50 frames for the posters because I was responsible for getting those <laughs> and making sure that they were so like I said so the things those are the things I'm responsible for I make sure they're done okay um next what do we have we have uh we have Randy Crooks who is a member for 18 months I don't know why it says that but it just says that thank you Randy it says hey Phil I just got an Ibanez AR520 HFM is it 8520 HFM so let's see if I'm good at this uh, so I've been as AR, so AR would probably mean that it's a semi hollow body or hollow body. No, AR is the series, right? So 520 H would be hollow. FM would be flame maple top. Let's, let's, let's search that. Let me copy paste it. So, and I'm not trying to guess it because I think I can get it. I'm just, I I've never tried and nor I can, I even think about trying to put all of the Ibanez numbers in my head. Uh, this is the, too much craziness, more details. This is it, H, uh, yes. Now you didn't say what color you got. Let me share it with everybody. Here you go, Web. This is the Ibanez AR520 HFM hollow body. Really cool. Uh, it's got the uh, uh, Gibson E PRS vibe. I like this guitar. I've always liked, I'm an Ibanez fan. Where's this one made? I'm just curious. In China, I didn't know if it was gonna be China, Indonesia. Like I said, it's almost impossible to have any guitars like this made anywhere besides China now because it's just getting so expensive to do this style of guitar, um, even at seven ninety nine. I know that sounds crazy, and some people are like, "What?" Um, uh, but I always mention now in videos, like I have an acoustic video coming out, and it's made in Indonesia, and I was really shocked for the price point because, again, you're not seeing a lot of guitars made in Indonesia, Korea, Japan, uh, that are anywhere near the price of affordable if they're semi hollows or hollow bodies, just because of the hand time that's involved in those type of guitars. So very cool guitar. What was the question besides you got a new guitar? So congratulations. Do I have any experience with this guitar? I just, that was my experience. You just saw it. We had it together. We <laughs> saw it. It was cool. Um, it says it has a lot of switching options. Yeah, you know, I don't know if I've ever tried that particular uh, Ibanez, but I've tried so many of the ones like it. Um, I like them. Like I said, I'm an Ibanez fan. You know, um, I, 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 sometimes it's because I like Ibanez, the brand, and I like the quality. And again, sometimes it's just because when I was a kid and I started playing guitar, Ibanez was the premium brand to me. Like, you know, the stores that I went to had all the knockoff brands. And so, so think of this to some players, uh, like I have friends and they're like, Ibanez is cheapo because they just remember Ibanez was knocking off all the brands they loved. By the time I got into guitar, Ibanez was like the, the who's who brand. I had all the great guitar players playing them at one time. You know, you had George Benson and Steve I and Paul Gilbert, you know, and Pat Metheny. You're like, literally like everybody you can think of was playing an Ibanez at that point. So when I started and then, uh, and I, when I went into stores, the Ibanez is where the guitars I couldn't afford because, you know, the i could afford the aria pros and the and the uh, uh jtx which was by applause and 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 uh and uh series 10 like all the you know the sub brands that's what i could put it you know uh, possibly afford so i have a thing for ivan is for that reason to me it's like you know just it was like a premium brand to me so i like it for a lot of reasons but also because i have a hang up <laughs> um Ryan says, I can't do the thin necks. This would not have a thin neck. You got to think with Ibanez, you got to understand, uh, Ibanez, it's really the, the RG series, right? Some of the Sabres or S series will have thin necks. Like for instance, the Joe, the Joe Satrani neck is, 
is a normal neck. They modeled after a Fender C neck. So like, there's a lot of guitars uh, that Ibanez makes where the necks are not like super thin. It's not, it's not, it's just there. It's just the main guitar that you see from Ibanez, the RG, which is, you know, kind of like their mainstay for the guitar for the nineties and the eighties and nineties vibe. But I mean, like uh, a lot of them are, are fine. Most actually like the, the guitar like that, most of their necks to me remind me of Gibson sixties necks. So a little on the thinner side, but not like the super shredder necks that you remember. Um, I'm a, I have a gem and the gem neck to me is again, not very thin. It's weird to me. It's always been weird to me that the RG 550 super thin. I remember the first time I played a gem and I thought well, this must be wrong. Cause why is this neck thicker? And it's because it's Steve. I didn't want a super thin neck. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Uh, okay. So this is, this is, I don't, I, I'm going to say Joe, Joe says, Hey, what is a good overdrive pedal that can do metal or blues? Uh, that's basically what I play. Sure. Uh, you know what? Uh, there's a lot of great pedals that do both. I mean, most your higher gain pedals for, uh, will do blues. You just back the gain off. Right. So I, I like the Freeman pedal, you know, the Freeman BE, the Freeman small box, the dirty Shirley, those for sure. I mean, you're talking about plexi style pedals that are great. I love them. Um, obviously Lawrence has this, the 87, which is again, it's going to do the higher kind of gain and then back off again with a little switch, which is really cool. Boss makes some ones, uh, they make a stack pedal. That's really good. Um, they make a, um, uh, trying to think what's the other one that i like uh, that's really cool there i think it's the metal something hold on i gotta now i gotta search it um because it's weird metal core i'm pretty sure that's it hold on because it's a weird pedal because yeah metal core so the boss metal core is one of my favorite like sleeper boss pedals right here 119 bucks and i bet you if we go on reverb you'll find it for you know 80 bucks but this pedal um, really can clean up and get into blues territory. It's not as just, it's not that chainsaw going crazy metal town all the time. So that's another great one too. I mean, there's a ton of pedals. What I would say is if you wanted to do metal and blues, I would definitely think about getting a, a more metal style pedal that cleans up well, and then worrying about a blues pedal and then trying to figure to drive it up into metal. So, uh, this, uh, yeah, the power stack, that's a great pedal. Like I said, there's a ton of ton of pedals. I mean, we could just go on. I could go on for the next 30 minutes just naming all the pedals. I feel like a lot of the pedals I play that I look at right now will do metal and do blues. There are a few that are just that are just too metal. Like for instance, I the metal zone is not gonna do blues, in my opinion. And as much as I love the EVH 5150 pedal, it's one of my favorite ones, you could get blues out of it, sure, but not as well as some of those other pedals I mentioned. It's like it's just really just hardcore. And then it kind of dries out and thins down when you, 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 you back the gain off. It's not the same magic. Um, to me, it's like, I, I, when you back off some of these pedals, that's why I said the ones I mentioned before are great. Even, you know, the boss ones too, because when you back it off, what I don't like is when the, they thin down, you know, so the gain goes down, but then they get thinner and they don't sound as full. So that's it. Um, so he says the blues driver. I like the blues driver. I don't know if I could pull off metal, even if you slammed something in front of it, like a boost or something, that's just not going to get you in the metal territory, but the blues driver is a great pedal. There's a lot of great blues pedals. Um, what I also would highly suggest, and sometimes this is, uh, one of the things I'm trying to improve on when I do the show is sometimes I, I answer the question you ask. And then a lot of times now I'm, I'm kind of like, I should answer the question that you really, you know, that you didn't ask, but may need to know. If you want a great pedal that does metal and blues, one of my best suggestions would be instead of buying an expensive pedal that can do metal and blues, buy two lesser priced pedals that are equally great for doing those things. That's one thing I would suggest. Um, as much as I like a lot of the pedals I, I said, I think uh, you could get, in today's market, you can get great pedals that are $50. I mean, there's no question about that. So I, I, to me, I would rather, I'm just going to say what I would do. If you gave me this scenario, I would probably buy two really nice, uh, uh, if my budget was $120, what I just showed you, $120 pedal, I'd be looking to get two pedals for $120 that do those two things great instead of one that does it, one and it does it, you know, not as good as the other. In other words, it does metal good, but not blues or does blues good, but not metal. Just do two, right? It's a, like I said, variety is the spice of life. So might as well in today's market where 
price is not always the holdback now because there's a lot of great stuff at every price point. I would look at getting two great paddles. So that's a suggestion to you. Um, Ram Dan something. <laughs> okay, says, hey, Phil, do you think the resurgence of great import guitar brands will lead manufacturers like Gibson and Fender to have Epiphone and Squire replace the, the made in USA models in terms of price? Um, well, uh, you know, look, I said it, uh, 200 episodes ago, at least when I said, look, the goal seems to be to get the import guitars to the price of the USA guitars, right? There doesn't seem to be, you know, in the long-term play, it seems like everybody really wants you to pay what you're paying for, uh, USA. And besides inflation, we're not talking about inflation. Of course, you know, like, Hey, I could have bought a USA guitar 10 years ago for what import guitar goes down. Yeah, we get inflation. What I'm saying is Physically, there's inflation, and then there's this concept of how to get the import guitar to be the same price as the USA guitar and then make the USA guitar this unobtainable, more unobtainable price point of, like, uh, you know, of of very custom, you know, right? Very premium. And so, so obviously, I think that's what's going on. But when you're, but to the core of your question, what I think is going to happen now is, and is obviously... There is no industry that I have seen that hasn't figured out yet to some degree that taking your pr uh, precious product and sending it to a factory, another factory to make a version of it doesn't seem to have some kind of negative effect. And I don't mean in this, everybody goes right to the whole, hey, when they sh ship a guitar overseas, it gets copied and it's on AliExpress. Of course that happens. Of course. I don't really think that's the problem. I mean, I don't think that's good, but I don't think it's a problem. Like I said before, I think the bigger problem is, is I think uh, you're allowing these companies to build all these guitars overseas, right? And I've said this before. It's interesting. I just had something really crazy, interesting happen to me. The president of Core Tech reached out, sent an email. I haven't responded back, so I got to respond back to him. Um, very nice email. He was just saying he's a big fan of the channel and he likes, you know, he learns something every every week. I was shocked to hear that, you know, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, he just wanted to say, Hey, he likes, you know, what I'm doing. And he, and he says he learns a lot. And what's interesting about that is, is exactly what I would have been saying is that, you know, companies like, like Cortec, um, are making guitars now to the point where, so, you know, just like world manufacturing Korea makes great guitars. It's getting to the point now, especially when I review guitars that I can pick up a guitar and just touching it and playing it and messing with it, I can just tell like this, this is the factory that did this, right? You just know, you can just see the great work that's coming out of great factories. And uh, I just did, like I said, I just did a review of a guitar and I was just blown away by how good it is and, and the price point. I was in shock. I did not know where it was made. Um, and then I just found out where it's made. And then of course, as soon as I, heard, I was like, right, I should have known. Cause of course it's a great guitar at the price. So, do I think this uh, this is going to change the way Gibson and Fender work in the long run? Yes, absolutely. There is going to be. Um, I think the brand. Uh, I think the brand thing is important. Obviously, brands are important. It's always going to be a thing. But I really think that um, the disruption is starting to happen now. Right? I see it every day. I see these brands that are you've never heard of just offering so much and they used to be fly by nights, but now they're kind of sticking, right? There's a lot of brands now. In fact, here's, what's really funny. Um, what's really funny about this and I'll kind of end it and go to the next subject, but, um, I'm working on, you know, I make lists and stuff for sometimes I like to make these list videos that I think are fun. And one of the list videos that I started working on is actually kind of going a weird way for me because what I'm really re realizing is, is that when I'm, talking about quality, right? Like I'm not talking about resale value. I'm not talking about, you know, brand, uh, you know, awareness. When I just talk about quality, almost every brand that I put in that list, when I, when I basically creating lists, right. You know, quality, you know, <laughs> right. Availability, right. All the brands in the just killing it quality category, they're brands that are not well-known brands. They're just killing it. And it's like they can't afford to have a bad day. They want every guitar to be great because they know what word of mouth is doing. They see it with social media. Think about that. 
Think about think about this this channel. Think about all the channels like this. Just on YouTube, we don't even have to worry about the other social media platforms. Just on YouTube, think of how many live shows are happening all the time in the gear community, and think about how many people in the comment section saying the same things everywhere we go. You see it. It's almost to the point where you just like, of course, somebody's always making a comment about Gibson's quality. Somebody's always making a comment about Fender's quality, right? They're always making a comment about certain brands' quality. But then when you look, you're like, the, there's these other brands, and there's just a lot of great things to say about them. So I think not only is it going to be a thing for Gibson and, and Fender, and the thing with Gibson Fender is I don't know if they're ever going to try to make Epiphone Squire replace the made in USA models, but they will definitely keep ramping them up, but they're ramping them up on the brand power. It is obvious to me, you know, as nice as they are, it's, it's, it's obvious to see that the, the new brands are trying harder. And we've seen this in the past. Remember, there was a time that, look, and we all know this, or maybe you don't know this. In the late 80s, early 90s, if it wasn't for grunge, this is a true statement. If it wasn't for grunge, you know, Ibanez was probably going to end up killing Gibson Fender, right? The, the, that market, you know, of, of just, and I don't mean Ibanez specifically, but it was definitely them as the lead. There was a lot of brands that were just making really great guitars to the point where players just weren't looking at Gibson Fender, not only because of the market, not only because of the music, but also for quality. And then all of a sudden it changed. And uh, when it changed, it kind of went back in Gibson Fender's, uh, you know, kind of realm again. Um, but it won't be hard to see that happening again to them. And, um, you know, I see it all the time. I, I see, I see it all the time. So let's see. Uh, okay. What else? Okay. This one's from Andy. Andy says, Hey, Phil for rock, hard rock. Okay. Do you recommend hotter strat pickups? If I'm using modern modeling amp or are hotter pickups unnecessary? What are the pros and cons of a hot V, uh, low output? I mean, hot. Yeah. Hot. I'm gonna say hot V maybe ceramic, uh, El Nico five. I'm, I'm okay. Anyways, uh, in the setup here, interesting enough, here's where I think there's a couple of things that are funny. Okay. Uh, that I think are going to happen, uh, simultaneously as well. Um, modeling units, whether that's the Kemper or the Axe effects, um, you know, the, you know, line six stuff. I'm just trying to think all this, the plugins, right. Amplitude, you know, all this stuff, right. Um, all these, uh, products out there to me seem to work better with a really strong signal. What I mean by that is a really good pickup that is putting out a really strong signal. Um, and so you're, I'm seeing it more and more. I'm seeing players use Fishman Fluence pickups. You're seeing players use, um, even EMGs cause EMGs are obviously like Fishman's of course. Um, DiMarzio X two ends, which were, you know, definitely the back in the day, that was the shredder pickup. Now you're seeing it more and more. Um, in my experience, when I play with through my tube amps versus my Kemper setup and stuff like that, I exactly, I noticed it right away too, that the guitars that I have that have the more powerful, higher output pickup, uh, uh, more, more, um, more wire, more, bigger magnets, you know, just put out a bigger signal. They do better with the modeler. It seems like the modelers, because you gotta understand the amps were always kind of like back in the day, the amps, you know, we wanted to push them harder. So not only do we use like, you know, tube screamers and boosts and things like that, but we were also getting the pickups hotter and hotter, right? More signal, more signal hit the amp, create the amp to overdrive even more. Then what happens is, is the amps got modernized to where they got master, you know, volumes and apparently more gain because it's, <laughs> and as they got more gain, the pickups now started reverting back and everybody started focusing back on the PAFs, the lower output pickups going backwards a little bit. Um, and, and if you're playing blues and, and if you're playing, you know, jazz again, lower output pickups were the key. What I find consistently now is that with the modeling units, giving them a strong signal seems to be the best thing for them. They seem to compensate. Uh, in other words, not like the tube amps where they, again, this, this signal, the hotter signal overdrives the amp, the modelers tend to just sound to me a little better with a, a fuller, bigger sound being pushed in them for the first part. And so what I think the trend will be slowly is I think we're going to see again, Fishman gaining ground. You're going to see the higher output pickups from Seymour Duncan and, and DiMaggio gaining ground. Um, and I think, um, I think that's what people are going to start going towards. And, uh, so I think that's actually, 
that's where I think the focus is going to be. Uh, higher output pickups and single coils, higher output pickups and everything. I think everything is going to go that way. Just because again, more signal into the model or seems to be, seems in my opinion, seems to be the, the better, <laughs> better, more usable. I find when I grab guitars and if I go to my Kemper setup, I tend to grab the guitars with a little higher output pickups and the Kemper does great. And that's what that's great. What's nice about that is also is those pickups are a little easier to make. You know, they're not as you know, there's not less unicorn magic in them and just more physics of this a bigger magnet <laughs> and more wire and just go. But there you go. But yeah, and so you guys know, so uh, Michael says, look up Polyphia and AAL. Yeah, you know what, uh, annals leaders and stuff. Um, yes, I. you see it. You see the connection real fast if you look that way. So you know, Phil Collin from Def Leppard. So you mentioned some newer bands. Let's just talk about some old scores. Phil Collin from Def Leppard, um, he's recording direct in into a, uh, Amplitude, and um, he's using the X2N and the Super Distortion from DiMarzio, I believe. Uh, again, higher output pickups. Uh, th the only reason I know that is Larry DiMarzio called me and we were talking one day and he asked me, he says, isn't that strange? And I said, no, this is exactly what I'm seeing, you know? And he was like, oh, because he did an interview with him. And um, uh, one thing that Larry does, which is very nice, he lets me read the interviews uh, before they get published, you know, just to, uh, you know, see what I thought of it. And I give him some feedback and I get to read uh, the interviews and the articles first. So you guys know, I just read an amazing article. I'll put a link to it. It's the 50th anniversary of the Super Distortion from DiMarzio. And uh, he, I've, I've read a couple versions of it. And his final version is great. And he put chapters in it. It's a very great story. Think about this. A lot of you right now probably having heart attacks. Please don't have heart attacks to hear, you know, the Super Distortion is 50 years old. <laughs> yeah, the modern the modern pickup. I mean, the Super Distortion is like the face of the modern pickup. The modern pickup is now 50 years old this year. That's right. Um, and um, so check it out. It's a great story. Um, and uh, and also, uh, you know, um, it's a great pickup. <laughs> so, 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 you, so you know. <sighs> All right. Um, let's, uh, let's go to some... Other questions. Let me refresh this. Somewhere. Okay. Antique Rocker says, hey, I've seen more brands than I can count, and I don't recall ever seeing more than one bass player. Oh, he said bands. Talk about being one <laughs> single-minded for me. I'm just brands. Uh, it says, I've seen more bands than I can count. And I don't count very high. No, I'm just kidding. I see more brands than I bands than I can count. And I don't recall ever seeing more than one bass player in a band. Multiples of instruments, uh, of other instruments, but what, why not bass? Is tuning a four-string bass to DGBE a thing? Uh, I mean, yeah, it is a thing. Um, there is a couple bands that I've, I've seen maybe do two bass players. Um, I've seen multiple bass players jam. I've seen bands that don't have a bass player. Ben Folds 5, I think, doesn't have a bass player or didn't, I think, when I saw them. Um, you know, my my experience is this, it's the reason you don't see two bass players is usually why you don't see two drummers very often. They're kind of like, they're kind of what they're doing. You know, more of it doesn't really make more. It just, right? So um, there are bands, of course, with two drummers, and there are bands with percussionists and drummers, and don't confuse what I'm saying when I say that, okay? Because um, obviously drummers and a percussionist, but... I'm talking about two physical, like, you know, five piece drummers or whatever, you know, you don't see a whole lot of that just like bass. I think the main reason is again, it's just, it's not necessary. Um, think about this. Usually the concept, the concept of two guitar players sure is to fill up the sound a little bit more with the band, but it's mostly because there's two parts happening. Maybe one's doing the leads and does the rhythm. One's doing other things. Maybe one of them's a singer and they need somebody to hold the thing. Um, you gotta understand as you add more musicians, you're adding more costs to your band. And that's a factor for a lot of people, you know, especially if your band's not getting paid a whole lot, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to split a hundred bucks four ways. It's really hard to split it, split it five ways, right? Six ways gets a little tough, you know, right? So, so there's a reason for that. But I think mostly the answer to your question is you don't see it a whole lot because I don't know if, what the advantage would be, uh, is two two bass players playing the same thing or even slightly different things. It's a lot, you know, once the low frequencies filled up kind of does its thing. 
Um, I see everything twice says, Hey, Phil, I had a chance to get a used TK Imperial MK Mark II. Okay. So Tone King Imperial Mark II. And a, oh, you had a chance to get a used Tone King Imperial Mark II or a new Black Cat. Which would you choose and why? Uh, well, I'm, I'm biased. So, you know, I've owned both those amps and I, I have my Black Cat. So that's what I, I kept. Um, I really like the Tone King Imperial. It was great. It was a great amp. I did a review of that one as well. Um, to me, it wasn't, it's not, so just for the, so you understand, for me, it was not that one of those amps was better than the others. The Black Cat does something that none of my other amps did. And the Tone King did something that my other amps did. So the Tone King Imperial 2, if you watch, I, I, I never say this. Okay. I never, you've never heard me ever say this. Um, when it comes to reviews of gear, especially non-guitar stuff like pedals and amps, I usually tell you like, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm the worst, but, uh, but on the Tone King amp, if there was one video in my entire catalog videos that I think I got it right, it was that amp. I think I explained it the best. Um, that there was, uh, there is very rare when this happens, but sometimes when I do a video, it's because, you know, some, you know, a company sends out a piece of gear, or sometimes you guys ask for a piece of gear, you know, a video, or sometimes I buy a piece of gear, but sometimes I do a video because I'm like, I just confused about a product. I watched 10 videos. I'm not anymore. I'm not better off in any way. And so I end up making the video, you know, and, and to clarify something that I didn't understand. And hopefully now you don't understand the Tone King Imperial to me, here's what happened. Everyone reviewed it. I watched it. It sounded great. It seemed like a great amp. And then I got the amp. <laughs> and then as soon as I got it, I, I realized that it's really just a Fender blackface and a Fender tweed. That's kind of what it does. It, it It's like my description of that amp and that video was the most, and to my opinion, the most accurate. Everyone else was like, it's this, it's that. It's like, no, it's really like, how do you get the clean tone of a blackface Fender, like a 65 Deluxe? and the tremolo and stuff, and then switch it over to like a tweed that's overdriven and give you a little bit of, you know, crunch. Here is the problem for me. I love that amp, but I actually own those two amps. The two amps that the Tone King is uh, copying, I own physically, I own those two amps. And I did that thing where I sat and I sat and I sat over a period of weeks, did the dilemma A being making myself crazy. And I wanted in every part of my body, I wanted to get rid of the two amps and keep the Tone King because that's the you know, physical for space. That's the smart decision. One amp does two things. But ultimately, I just couldn't come up with a good reason to get rid of my fenders. So I kept the two fenders, which is my uh, Fender uh, 5E3, my tweed, and my uh, 65. And I let the Imperial go. The Bad Cat Black Cat, I don't know how to explain what it does. It's like... It's not my fa it's not my favorite overdrive amp. It's not my favorite clean amp. It just does something that's really cool. And when I play it, it's really percussive and it has this great tone and I just like enjoying playing it. And uh, really good amp. <laughs> it just did. So, so again, it's uh, there to me, they're also different animals. Like to me, they're the only thing they have in common is they're both expensive. That's the thing of those two amps. If you were asking me like, what do they have in common? That's it. They're both USA made in California and they both cost a lot of money. Other than that, to me, they're different animals. To me, the t Tone King would be if you like a Fender Tweed and a, and a, and a black face. And the, bla the Black Cat is if you like a darker martial tone distortion with a chimey Fender kind of clean kind of thing going. But neither one of those tones being exactly that. In other words, it's not very, it's Fender-esque and Marshall-esque, but it's not a Fender Marshall clone for sure. Because it's got a little bit of something else going on, which is cool. Um, Ace says, Hey, Phil, first off, Baba Booey. <laughs> That's funny. That's an old joke from the show, obviously. Uh, secondly, uh, new guitar day. I got an Ibanez hollow body AF 75 T used for a great price. I think, I think they were discontinued. Yeah. Um, so that's another hollow body style Ibanez, right? Let's paste. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's a hollow body. I'm showing them new. Let's see. Go here. This is it. You just share the guitar, maybe. Oh, this is an AF75. So it's different than what you you got. No, you got AF75T. The T is discontinued. Let's show it to you guys. So this is what he got. 
So yes, uh, when you look up uh, AF75T, this guitar comes up. Hey, here's a used one. And uh, the new ones don't seem to say T, so that's different. Um, T would be for, I'm guessing, for tremolo, right? So if we go back to the new ones that don't say T, I'm going to assume that because they don't say T and they don't have a tremolo, that it means they're not, that's not the tremolo. That's pretty cool. Again, very Gretsch kind of vibe. I like it. It's got the, uh, the, uh, uh, very Gretsch. I want to say penguin. What is wrong with me? Uh, uh, white Falcon kind of vibe to it. So very cool. Um, back. I feel like I, I got too many screens up guys. Hold on a second. Let me, as I'm doing these searches, it's getting a little chaotic. Okay. Um, Mike loves robots. <laughs> okay, Mike. Hey, Phil, wife is away for the weekend. Any suggestions for what to practice that could make a difference in my guitar playing in just a few days? Oh, yeah. First, play louder. Uh, and that's not a, that's not a, like a stupid thing to be like, you know, ha ah, she's out of town, play louder. No, seriously, playing louder is, 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 ha, has an, a, a thing to it. Um, sometimes when you play louder, even when you're practicing things, uh, things come out of the guitar and the amp that you're not used to, uh, not only feedback, but just other things. And then that just leads you down different, uh, roads. Um, what I would do is also try to play as many songs as you can. Look, when you're practicing, you know, especially like I said, the wife's, the wife's way, you have the house to yourself, play a little louder, play some songs and just get the practice in that way. Uh, I'm not going to really tell you like to practice your scales or practice this or, you know, right? No, play some songs. Uh, pra that's what you want to practice. Learn some songs, practice them, you know, get, pull them up on YouTube, on the TV, learn a couple songs. And like I said, play them a little louder. That would be a really cool thing. Um, so, you know, it, when my wife goes out of town, that's usually what I do, which sometimes sucks because the kids are here and then they're like, oh my God. <laughs> uh, but, uh, that's what I like to do. So lit face says, Hey, Phil, my specific tools are quality. Okay. I don't have good generic tools when needed, like players, pliers or screwdrivers. What should I get if I want quality? So you're talking about like my specific tools are quality, but I don't have any generic tools when needed, like pliers or screwdrivers. Um, I guess I don't understand the question. One of the problems is, I guess, uh, for screwdrivers and pliers and things like that, I'm not really, I don't know if there's a brand of tools I, I trust. I just kind of like, I think all my tools, I don't have any brands that I stick with. I mean, not even like Stu Mac or anything like that. I mean, it's like when I, they, I kind of just seek out a tool that I like and if it feels good and it, and it works for me, I just buy it, but I don't have like a brand I would, I would suggest, um, the, if you look at the, any pictures of my shop or, you know, videos of my shop, you're not seeing any uniformness. The only thing you probably see the most of is Stu Mac tools, but the majority of my Stu Mac tools are because they're the only ones that made that tool. I wasn't really given an option. There's some very strange tools that Stu Mac makes. Um, a lot of tools like reamers and stuff like that. And again, those aren't from Stu Mac. They're not from any brand or just again, I just find the quality. So I guess my only suggestion for this question would be is just find, you know, look for a good quality tool and buy it. And I don't really know specifically like screwdrivers. I don't have any, uh, there is no consistent, like I don't have a uniform set. My wife actually has uniform tools. Like I think her tools are like Stanley or something like that. Something where everything's like yellow and black. Like if you watch my tools, like literally all my tools are all over the place. Like that's why there's no uniform colors. Like my screwdriver set, I don't have a screwdriver set. I have just random screwdrivers that I just found and liked. <laughs> uh, so, um, there you go. Uh, David says, I still don't have a question. I'm just sending a couple bucks. I appreciate that, man. Bedroom guitar guy says, Phil, does the potentiometer value really matter? Uh, and their tolerance are some, some are 20%. That is a lot for 250 K. Um, well, first of all, it, do they matter? It does matter. Everything matters. Is it the most valuable thing? Is it the most important thing to the sound, the tone? No, like I said, um, I don't believe that if I, if I took most of your guitars that were, let's say uh 250 K Strat and I put 500 Ks in there, I don't believe most of you would even notice like, Hey, my guitar seems brighter today. I don't think you guys would notice. 
Um, it's too subtle. It's too, it's too. Now keep in mind, uh, most potentiometers aren't what they say anyways. Like I said, if you put a multimeter on them, you're going to find out the values are all over the place. They're off by, by more than 20% even. Um, but generally speaking, this is what's important. Okay. And this is probably a better way to answer this question. This, the question that I get so many times and so many different versions of, of, of this one specific thing, like, Hey, how much does a pickup really matter? How much does a potentiometer matter? How much does the output jack really matter? How much does the wire in a guitar really matter? How much does this really matter? And how much does tone wood matter? Right. And some people say none and some people say everything, but we could argue very easily. Everybody can all over the internet. We'll argue forever. Um, some channels, cause it's usually a channel discussion, you know, some channel will go, Hey, this, this is what matters, right? This one thing makes a huge difference. Okay. So let me use that argument for ex example. Okay. Um, the, the potentiometer, I just said, I could change it. And most of you guys wouldn't notice. So it doesn't matter that much, but it still matters. And here's why, because although you could argue, I would argue that a potentiometer is not as important to the overall tone of the guitar, the tone of sound, whether it means how much brightness or darkness it has, uh, in other words, bass or treble, or, you know, just clear clarity or, you know, uh, how muffled it is. That's true. Those things do not have as much relevance to the overall tone, but collectively that stuff starts all adding up. And that's why we focus on this. No one should be going like, I changed my potentiometers and therefore it sounds amazing now. It can happen. Don't get me wrong. But that's not really the thing. When somebody says, uh, like a, for instance, uh, if I change my pickup from something that's a brighter pickup to a darker pickup, it had I can just adjust that in the amp. Of course you can. Of course you can. Again, like I said, everything is small increments. Everything is small, right? The subtle, think about this. The subtlety and just when you bend a string with your hand, the difference between bending it and, and the tone sounding pleasant to the ear and the bending it and it sounding harsh, flat or sharp is subtle. We, we, music is a subtle thing and it's collective. So, uh, like I always say, when you talk about your gear, it is collectively, it's not just a pickup. It's not just a uh, speaker. It's just not a it's not uh, the wood, it's not the strings, it's not those things, it's all of those things. Like I said, it's your mind, it's your ear. It starts with how you hear, then how you process, then how that information gets to your hands, what your hands end up doing, then to the string that it's there touching, into the neck wood in the body that's then being picked up by the pickups and what the bridge and the net and the and the tuning keys are doing into the electronics out what your cable does the type of cable does the type of guitar cable you have uh, matter again not very much i could actually go down a whole think about this if you were to get, make a list of every single component between essentially your strings to your physical speaker, which is where the sound physically comes out, right? So let's say the starting point is the strings and it goes, you know, strings to bridge to tuning keys into the body, the wood and the neck, and, right? Into the pickups, into the electronics, out the output jack, into the guitar cable, into the input, how many tubes you have, right? what kind of tubes, the quality of the tubes, the type of power tubes, the type of transformer to all that stuff, to the speaker, to what kind of wood the box is made out of. Do all those things matter the most? No, none of those things in any one of them matter that much, but collectively start adding up. <laughs> and so we don't, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to hyper-focus on little things because if you're, when you're trying, when you're trying something like, for instance, let's say you're recording right now. I said, all those things matter. We're recording a song and you go, man, it's a little bright. Look, the easiest fix is just adjust the tone control, <laughs> right? It's the easiest fix. Go to your amp, less, less bright, more bass, right? That's the easiest. It fixes the problem. However, that's not the, the, that's not the real issue. The real issue is when you do that and you go, okay, that now it's not as bright, but now it sounds too muddy. See what I'm saying? You're constantly chasing this because it is a significantly, all these things collectively create a, a sound. And what you're after. So, um, so potentiometers, do they matter too much? They don't, but overall everything adds up. So it's back to the, you start with a good foundation. Your foundation is going to be your playing style, right? How well you play. That's pretty much the most important thing, right? Like if, 
if you're going to ask me, and I've, I've said this before, if you're going to ask me like, what's more, what's money better spent lessons or quality gear? It's lessons, obviously better musician, better sounding music. It's just, that's, you know, right. It doesn't get any harder than that. Um, think about this. Um, the one thing that kind of cracks me up is where musicians sometimes argue and don't understand what they're saying to each other it really kind of cracks me up. Um, I told you, I learned a whole, whole lot owning a store and watching guitar players all day. It was probably the most interesting thing that's ever happened to me in life. You know, people watching is always interesting and always uh, insightful, but watching guitar players, and to me, nothing is more honest than how people spend their money right? Money is so valuable to so many of us. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's why the saying money talks and bullshit walks, excuse the language, but it's just like such a great saying, right? It's like, just, you know, basically if you're not spending your money, you're full of it. Right? So watching people and how they spent their money is really honest to me, watching somebody tell me what mattered to them, but then what they spent it on really what showed me the answer. And what I learned watching guitar players is the reality is guitar players don't hit the string, like on the same guitar, like 10 guitar players will pick up that strat and not all 10 of them will hit the same spot when they play the strat. In other words, the pick, some of them play in between the bridge and the middle pickup. Some of them play in between the, the bridge, or sorry, the middle and the neck pickup. Some of them play with the palm always on the bridge. They're right after the bridge and they're hitting really hard. Some of them play kind of with their hand over the strings hovering and they pick a little light regardless of the amp, the pickups, all of that, that just alone, that one factor, 10 guitar players pick up the same guitar player, the same amp, same everything and sound 10 different ways just from that one thing. So I could argue that learning where you're going to hit the string physically with the pick is going to change it. Um, I would, I would watch a guitar player play and say, Oh, this is bassy and muffly and I can't stand it. But, it's because where he plays that setting, that gear did not work for them. And then another player would go, this is perfect. And then, so the argument is, was that the gear or the player? It was the player, but the gear, it, it hinders and it helps a little bit, right? So that's kind of why I like these discussions. Cause it's hard to put this into a type of video, right? But in a podcast format, we can have this discussion. This is to me is why you should pay attention to all these things, but don't hyper-focus on them. That's, you know, cause again, you can make yourself crazy and, and fixate on things that are not as relevant. Right. Um, and the end result, you're trying to make music. And as long as you're accomplishing that, you're winning, you're doing the right thing. You're winning. Right. <laughs> you know, I, who doesn't like a being some gear sometimes, but if you end up a being gear more than you're playing music, you are definitely probably not going to enjoy this in the long term, Cause it'll, cause that just, that chasing those rabbits, <laughs> going down that rabbit hole and chasing those rabbits is is not, is not as pleasant. Um, no, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know what Tony say. Tony's like speaker cone tone paper is a thing. It is again, we could argue speakers, what they're made out of all this stuff, all this stuff matters a little, but again, it does matter. That's why I like the idea of just saying, why don't we put percentages to it? That's why I don't like somebody who, who I don't want to say I don't like them. I don't like it when somebody says this, like Tonewood doesn't exist. Anyone who thinks Tonewood is a thing is stupid. It's like, okay, look, it's not that I 100% disagree with you, but I mean, we have to factor in that something, it has some effect somehow. It has some effect. If it's just heavy, if it's just light, whatever it is, does it matter? That's a better question to me. Does it matter to me? Tone wood does not matter to me. That is my answer to you guys, by the way. I've said it before in a ton of my videos. Um, the, the, uh, uh, when somebody, I'll say it all the time, like, oh, this is basswood. And they go, oh, basswood is cheap. And I go, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what they make the guitar out of as long as it's the weight I want to play. <laughs> it's the weight I want. So, so there you go. So that's my, that's my thoughts on, on that. And more, more importantly, I just think it's a, a more honest way to talk about these things. Right. Um, so there you go, but changing pots has some effect and you can change things mildly. And again, uh, collectively, it will make some difference when it's added all up in the end. Mike says, does your firebird have an ebony fretboard? Uh, it does. It does have an ebony fretboard. Uh, that color is absolutely stunning. I thought so as well. I, I paid too, too, in my opinion, I paid too much for this guitar. Um, 
I love the Uncommon Colored Gibsons like that Firebird uh, and your uh, Chicago Music Exchange SSG. Me too as well. I, 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 the Firebird, I just didn't want another Sunburst guitar. Um, I bought the Firebird. So, you know, I bought the Firebird and the Rickenbacker for the channel. And, and like I've said this before, when I buy guitars to do videos with, and I've done this a ton of times when I've done GNLs and other guitars, you know, the Kiesel I bought, the Vader, the Kiesel. Um, I did a Vola guitar. I'll buy a guitar and I say it's for the channel, but here's what's different. Like I just told you I bought a guitar uh, this week. That's for me. I bought that guitar because I wanted it. The one I'm going to get. Um, these guitars, I go, this will be an interesting video. Like I said, I don't own any non-strat style guitars, maybe just a couple less Paul style guitars. Maybe this is the right fit for me. And that's a video because I'm sure some of you guys are curious about that, you know, right? And it's a cool video and you don't see a whole lot of Firebirds in videos. So I go, okay, that'll be a video. And what ends up happening is at some point I'll either decide I like it, I love it, I want to keep it. And then I just make some decision to, to acquire it for me, keep it for me, or I just, it goes on its way. So I, I want, I bought it in this red because sometimes I have to think about that particular thing. Like if I buy this, do a video and, and sell it, that's great. But if I end up liking it, I want to get a color that I might like. And that's why I picked the red. <laughs> I just thought it was really cool. Um, to answer uh, anyone's question, I'm sure somebody asked and I didn't see it. Like, you know, hey, uh, have I done a video or how that's going? Um, funny story. It's not so funny. Um, it showed up and literally I tuned it up. And as I tuned it up, the E string broke on it and I haven't played it at all. <laughs> In fact, um, Ralph saw it and the first thing out of his mouth was, oh, the high E string broke. And I said, yeah, it broke when I was tuning the guitar up. And he goes, oh, so in a month or two, you'll change the string. And I'm like, I'll, sooner than that, because I'm doing a video is what I told him. But I go, but yeah, it's going to be a little bit now because <laughs> my brain says, like, hey, I, I got to film that video. Oh, I got to restring it. Oh, I got to take it downstairs. Oh, I got other things to do. And that's, so I'm getting there. Uh, Grumpy uh, Mike Guitar says, when I got, was going to ask if I should buy that guitar but I know your answer. <laughs> yeah. If you, yes. If, you, if, you, if your question is, should you buy a guitar? The answer is yes. Cause we're enablers here. It's the worst. It's why it's why you shouldn't ask that question on the show. Right. Cause it's always going to be yes. We, we want to help the economy and buy guitars, the guitar economy. Um, Brad guitar Miller says, thanks for all you do for this community. Uh, for especially, the free business advice is an invaluable. Thank you. You know, I, I thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. I always appreciate those. It's always nice and kind things you guys say. I, you know, obviously I appreciate those kind words. Um, I, um, I sometimes, I remember I have to watch every episode cause I timestamp them. So after I watch what I say, I, sometimes I go, Oh, I'm such an idiot. And then sometimes I go, Oh, that was pretty smart. I can't believe I said that <laughs> more the latter. <laughs> But I appreciate the thank yous because sometimes it makes me go, okay, uh, I'd be lying if I didn't say that uh, most of the time, I don't know the percentage, to say most of the time that I watch, uh, I timestamp my show, I think, I probably shouldn't do this show anymore. I'm This is stupid. <laughs> and then when somebody goes, I like it, I go, oh, okay, good, because I was thinking it was dumb. <laughs> <laughs> so David, uh, says, Hey, any idea update on the Paul, Re uh, PRS Paul Reed Smith MT 100. He's talking about the Mark Germani 100. When I interviewed Mark Germani, um, here's what I know about it. If this helps, uh, I interviewed Mark Germani, um, and he talked about the MT 100 coming out and how much he loved it and how it's going to have a dumble sound for the center channel. Um, and, uh, this is all I know. The, uh, people at Paul Reed Smith, after I did the interview, we got the interview I did with uh, Mark Tremonti had nothing to do with PRS. They didn't uh, set up the interview. Um, it was set up by his manager who, if you guys recall, I did a bunch of videos. I interviewed him, John Petrucci, Zach Wild, uh, Michelangelo Badio, and um, a bunch of others, you know, right? A bunch of other great people, musicians. And uh, it was all because they have like the same manager. And so that manager, a friend of mine hooked me up with the manager and the manager had me do these videos. And, um, I, I had this great idea. I was like, this is going to be fun. Um, I'll do these interviews as like supplemental podcasts. Right. So this'd be great because it does great, you know, on the podcast forum and I'll get individual sponsors. In other words, I'll get companies to sponsor these and, uh, it'll be a nice little side, 
uh, revenue stream, right? I can interview people and have discussions. And, um, what ended up happening was I, it's one of those things you just learn, right? Um, the gear community here is more focused on the gear than they are on the, on those type of interviews. And, um, there's more to it. Let me tell you the more to it part. Cause it's to, to say that it's almost unfair to you guys to say that here's what happened when, when musicians, musicians are no different than companies. This is what I learned from the interviews. Okay. So I did those interviews. What I learned is that when they want you to interview those musicians, it's cause they're selling something. Sometimes it's easy. It's like their new album or something. Right. So that's why they're doing a junket. They're, they're out there being interviewed by all these uh, people like us and, uh, these people on YouTube or whatever. And, and, um, so the whole interviews have to be kind of like structured to talk about the thing they got to sell. Right. It's just like when you watch late night TV and they're like, tell us about your new movie. But deep down, that's not the thing you want to hear about. <laughs> right. It's kind of like when you go see your band, you want them to play all the songs you love, not necessarily all the songs that you don't know so much. Um, and so what ended up happening was the, the views weren't very good on the, on the videos. Those videos didn't do well. In fact, they did uh, less than 10% of what a normal viewed video did for me. That's not a big deal, but I mean, that just like shows that you guys weren't very interested in that type of format. So I got sponsors for it. And, um, one of them was Donner and, um, just to show you, and again, you know, thanks to Donner for doing the sponsorship. Um, <laughs> I'm pausing cause I'm like, I shouldn't say this. I'm going to say it. Um, Donner paid me to not do an interview. Um, so I'm not making this up. I got, I had uh, Donner sponsored one of the videos and, um, and, uh, paid me, uh, it's not very much. You don't get much. Like, let me put it this way. You can't go out to a really nice dinner with what you get paid sponsored to, to do one of those videos. And, uh, I did a bunch and the views weren't that great. And the interaction was very low. Okay. In other words, you guys weren't engaging for very long. And, uh, so Donner reached out and said, Hey, we'll pay you. I think they paid me two and a half times. So, uh, more than double what they normally pay me to not continue sponsoring. And I was like, what? And they were like, yeah, you can just, you know, if you just want to mention this somewhere else or something, they're like, we're not seeing any advantage of this. There's nobody engaging with it. And so, um, so anyways, why do I say that? I'm just telling you that's what happened with those. Cause a lot of you guys asked like, how come I stopped doing those? And then, um, I think cause they didn't do very well. The people who had me doing those interviews didn't ask me to do any more. I'm sure that's what that was about. Um, I enjoyed them. I, I think the people who watched them enjoyed them. And, uh, you know, it's good. And I, I like trying new things. I'll continue as, as you guys know, I try all kinds of things on the channel, like all, all the other channels out there to see what new and exciting things I can come up with. And there's just certain things that I, you know, I do it. I, I want to say knocks it out of the park that does really well. Um, this show is one of those things that averages 50,000 views and 200,000 streams on podcast. I mean, that's insane, right? Um, so this does well. The deep dives do very well. They average a hundred thousand views per uh, thing. So again, and the engagement is high. It's not the views. Don't confuse what I'm talking about with money. A hundred thousand views necessarily just like 50,000 views doesn't pay a whole lot of money. It's not about money. It's just about if you're making something, you like people to enjoy it and you can tell how long they engage with it. Um, but anyways, this is why this is important to the story with Mark Tremonti. That's where that interview came from. And so he decided, uh, cause I'm gear centric. In other words, I like gear. So of course I, I, leaned into that more so in the conversations with those guitar players. And he talked about his amp afterwards. I got the impression that wasn't a good idea because the people from PRS reached out and basically said, I wish he wouldn't have said all that. We were, we have like, they basically alluded to me. It's a year or two, which so already it's been over a year, I think or a year since I interviewed him. Um, it's a year or two before that amp comes out. <laughs> so, um, I happened to be privy that, um, there is going to be a new product launch from, uh, uh, PRS coming soon in the next month or two. Um, cause I was kind of, they told me, <laughs> told me something that's coming out and I'm like, Ooh, it's really cool. Um, but it's not that, like I said, I can't tell you what things are, but I, I will tell you what things aren't cause I don't see the downside in that for them. So, um, the two, two th products that I was made aware of that P PRS has coming out, that's pretty cool. Both very cool and very exciting. Neither one of those are the Tremonti amps. <laughs> so no Tremonti amp on the, uh, in the uh, near future that I see. So, and that's why we discussed it. And, um, and, uh, there you go. All right. Uh, Sasha says, Hey, Sasha says, Hey, spinal tap, big bottom, three bases. Oh uh, yeah. Well, of course, of course. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
Was it three? I thought it was two bass players. But yeah, well, I guess it was three. It's been a while since I've seen that movie. So it's one of the few I've tried, you know, like a lot of us older uh, folk do. Uh, I try to get like the classics like that to get your kids to watch them. Like I try to get my kids to watch Airplane. I have some luck, right? I don't know if I told you this. This is a sad but true story. Um, I had my son watch the Blues Brothers. He told me he hated it. Um, I almost disowned him, which is a really sad thing because, you know, at that time he was a little younger. Uh, he was in his te early teens, I think. And uh, so luckily for him uh, that we watched that week uh, and he said he hated it, which was enough for me to like literally disown him. And then that weekend we watched Caddyshack and he liked it. So we were friends again, which is good, you know. <laughs> and and I, I decided to continue to, uh, <laughs> to, to feed and pay for his housing but uh so anyway so yeah i try to get my kids to watch certain stuff like that and like i said some of it lands and some of it's the uh stuff doesn't um so but so you know some stuff really lands um i'm so proud of my daughter she's graduating high school and uh i got to see her um i got to see her um uh yearbook and they had her senior quote next to her name and because they get a senior quote and her senior senior quote was groovy sam ash and uh i was like oh i was proud papa uh for those of you guys who know i'm a huge sam ash uh <laughs> fan <laughs> so that was awesome um so <laughs> anyways i we gotta probably finish up and talk about guitars okay um we have a couple more questions and then we'll our subjects and we'll finish up here Right now, I'm just looking at a blank screen. So while I look at the blank screen, I'll drink some water. Des Truck 2, that's what I'm going to say, says, as modeling gear gets cheaper, such as the Tonex pedal, do you think pedal boards will slow down and try to compete or stick with their niche? Pedal brands. I don't know what's wrong with me, guys. I'm sorry. Bands is brands and pedal brands. Okay. So, and so basically the question is as modeling gear gets cheaper, such as the Tonex, great question, right? Tonex. Uh, do you think pedal brands will slow down and try to compete or stick with their niche? Um, no, I don't think they'll compete. The, the, the reality is this, we, we, I think if you're at, you know, what, what's my instinct, my instinct is, um, amp brands and pedal brands will decrease, um, as these modeling technologies grow. This is, um, uh, I kind of like think of it like mom and pop stores, right? There's no absolute zero. I don't have anything in me that says, oh, the death of the mom and pop shop. There'll be no guitar stores anymore. It'll all just be Sweetwater and Amazon. Like, I don't think it's going to be like that. What I do think though, is like Sweetwater and retail, Sweetwater and Amazon and things like that are just going to keep gaining internet market and internet share at a bigger, bigger rate. Of course, with Reverb out there too, which is a lot of mom and pops as well too. But does that growth is not only... I do I think happening, it's gonna, it's guaranteed. That will hurt the smaller mom and pop stores that don't have a great business plan or a plan to live in that environment by being unique or interesting, right? Uh, having cool used gear, having cool things, doing events, doing, uh, you know, offering services that these companies can. Again, find your niche, so to speak, uh, your, your term. Uh, and then same with pedal companies and amp companies. Look, it, in my experience, I think, uh, as someone who's look, you're watching and hanging out with me because we have something in common. We are all, uh, we're all people who love guitar and gear, right? I mean, that's the whole point of this. This is where this community came from. Right. Um, and because I think this is how I kind of think like, okay, if you're watching me, we're kind of seeing things the same. In other words, it's like, I'm not saying you should listen to me. I'm saying I am you and you are me in, we have this same passion. That being said, I kind of watch what I do. And then I, I notice that like, that is probably what the market's doing. In other words, because obviously I'm not leading the charge. I'm just part of the group. All right. So I have a Kemper. I really like it on my personal time. I play my Kemper. Like right now I'm looking at my Kemper because that's what I was playing right before the show started. I was plugged into my Kemper in front of me. I know you guys can't see it, but in front of me is a stack of two stacks of amps in front of me, right? 
Um, and what I've done over the, and this is again, so you guys don't get confused over the years, watching the channel, you've seen my amps collection change and it's gotten really expensive and very like, you know, like right in front of me right now, I have the Marshall JMP. I have the Friedman small box. I have an amplified nation, uh, Amplophonics and gain. I'm I gotta look behind me. I think I got the Ingle Fireball 25 that I still love, by the way. Uh, I got the, um, uh, Maz 18 by Dr. Z and I have the bad cat, black cat. These are just some of the amps I can see because I'm staring at a monitor and this stuff's in front of me. Um, my point is those amps are very expensive and very specialized. And to me, if they're not, if it's not a specific, beautiful experience, I'll just play my Kemper. <laughs> That's just how I kind of feel about this stuff. So do I think, uh, pedal builders will, kind of try to adapt and, and try to get in that market? No, but I think what's going to happen is some pedal companies are going to become so pedestrian that they're just going to die off. Okay. In other words, um, if you're, if, if you're not going to have, I'm sure it's people will collect pedals, just like people collect guitars and people collect, uh, you know, Legos and beanie babies and whatever else things to collect. But that being said, really what's going to happen is your, your pedals are going to have to have a purpose. And if that purpose is just that they're unique or that they're cool, or they do something that, um, to you spiritually, even, you know, that, that makes you feel a certain way that's important. Otherwise function is not a thing anymore. So in other words, what I'm saying is I don't need an amp for it's just to be a function of having an amp. I need an amp to be something far beyond what the modeling thing can do for me. Same with the pedal. It has to be uh, great. So I think, um, I think that's, what's going to happen with pedal companies. They're going to have to continue to make really great pedals, just like amp companies are going to have to make really great amps because, um, I think a lot of companies like, look, we were seeing like companies like crate disappeared and, and PV's on its way out to, you know, the door in, in a second, any day now. Um, uh, I'm just saying that because, you know, I mean, again, you're, you're seeing a lot of the brands that the, a lot of the companies that just want to focus on making you an affordable amp, they are not going to last, right? Because not all of them, some of them, let, like maybe line six will survive it. And maybe, you know, a couple others will survive it, but the vendor of course will survive it because it's just, again, they can, Fender can, Fender has so many products that obviously keeping a small line of affordable amps is going to make sense. But essentially, man, you're just not going to see a lot of that stuff. You're going to see uh, exactly that. Everything's going to have a specific purpose. You're going to, you're going to have an amp that you love and like maybe a couple amps that you really love, a couple pedals you really love, and then you're going to use some kind of modeling tech for the majority. And by the way, and then there'll be people who will never use the modeling tech. So I have a friend who says, uh, he'll never play a Kemper or any modeling tech as long as he lives. And I said, I understand that. And then not to be rude or mean to him, but as friends, I said, but you don't actually make any music or do anything. So that sounds really great, but I'm always either recording or doing something. And that tech literally, I don't know how, I don't have an analogy. I do. It's a calculator. Like I don't want to do math without a calculator now in my life. Right. At this point in my life, I want a calculator at this point in my life. When I'm typing a letter on, on an email, I want spell check. I want, right. I need that technology. I want that tech. I want GPS now at this point. These are convenient things. If you're the kind of person who's like, I'm never going to use GPS. I'm going to use maps. Good for you. It's good. That's great. Uh, you know, uh, if you're going to not going to use a calculator, you're going to use a piece of paper to add great. If you're going to still play a tube amp instead of a modeling tech, that's fine. And, and I don't have a problem with that. Obviously I'm just explaining like a lot of my decisions for any kind of modeling tech is just for the physical function, like sitting there, miking up your amp for hours to record is not a good use of my time. It's just not. So like I said, in videos, I still use amps for videos to, and that's it. And, uh, and you know, it's again, it's a function. It's just, I don't know. That's just my thoughts on that. Um, and as I've pointed out, um, pedal wise, I don't know how many pedals I have. I think I have 30 pedals. And like I said, at one point I must have had three, 400 of them. It's not because I don't like pedals anymore. I just, I don't have a huge use for them. I don't, I, I, I have a few, the ones I have now are the ones I truly love. And I use, I actually use all of them and same with amps. I probably have a few more amps than I actually truly love and use, but I do have a YouTube channel and companies send amps and you know, it just, you know, and there's a couple amps, um, 
like for instance, there's a couple of my amplifiers that I just know if I get rid of, um, I'm trying to put it the best way. If I get rid of it today, uh, or if I get rid of it, get rid of it in five years, I'll make more money in five years. So might as well just sit on it because uh, like, I'm not in a hurry to get rid of it and it's not going to be worth less in five years. I think it will be worth more. So, uh, funky groove. I like these. I'm going to stay in your con. Um, so no more super chats. I just want to stay in the comment sections for a second. It says funky groove says, in my opinion, positive grid went the wrong direction with the spark go again, in my opinion. Um, you know, I, I've not tried any of the other spark, uh, products. Like I said, they sent the original spark out and then, you know, I don't know. They just never <laughs> felt the need to send any more products out. Um, I've talked about the spark. Somebody actually made a comment. What was the comment about spark? I saw it. It kind of made me chuckle and I, I grabbed it, but it didn't come up in my thing. Maybe I didn't grab it. Oh yeah. It was from, uh, Val Valdas says, Hey Phil, I just got the spark go today and it sucks. <laughs> no go. So the spark go, um, I have not tried the spark go. What I can tell you is that I still have and still love my black star fly amp that I bought from my Sam Ash video in 2017. And I still love that amp actually. Okay. Just, just because, you know, I always say something and then I just like kind of picture one of my friends saying something. When I say I still have it, it's not actually true. I, I gave the one I bought the black one away and now I have a green and pink one because I thought the green and pink one was cool and I gave the other one away anyways. Um, but I've always had one. So I've had one since I bought one. I just changed it out. Same model, just mine's green and pink. Uh, I just thought it was cool graphic and my buddy wanted it and I, I gave it to him and got the new one. But I've had the fly, uh, the uh, Black Star fly. Um, to me, that amp sounds amazing. Uh, when I travel, that's what I use. I use, uh, I take my, uh, my Kiesel Delos headless guitar, or I'll take the Strandberg headless and I'll take that little amp. And I just, oh, I love playing it. It's great. It was, I bought mine for 59 bucks. I don't know what they are now. What are they now? Let's see. Hold on. Um, and this is, and this is again, I just, cause I want to, you guys don't mind. This is the conversations I like to have sometimes because this is, um, it's $74 now, 7499. So 75 bucks. Let me show you. This is it. This is the black star fly. I absolutely love this amp. Some of you are probably going to right now putting in the comments cause I can't see I'm in the screen. Uh, you know, I love this other one more. Look, Oh, I like how they put a little guitar pick next to it to show you the scale of it. There you get, you get the idea. Um, what do I like about it? I like that it takes like a bunch of double A batteries. Look at that two, four, six double A batteries. It lasts forever. You can plug it in and charge it. I think it's just nine volt, uh, plug. I can't, I think, I don't know. I don't, I don't use the batteries. Um, it's got a delay right on it. And I use that and, and it sounds reverby to me and I can plug in my, uh, you know, anything I want. It doesn't have Bluetooth. It doesn't have uh wackiness. It's durable. It's cheap. It sounds good. And when I'm away, uh, and I'm traveling, I usually use it on my software on my laptop. So if I want all those amp tones and stuff, I've showed you guys this before. I use like uh, ample tube or what's the other one. Uh, there's two programs and I have them both. I have one on each computer. I never remember which one's which, um, but I use a program and then I use my laptop and I plug in an interface and I'll just use my laptop. But most of the time, like I said, I, when I'm playing music, I don't really want to be on my phone. So I don't want an app. I don't want to be on my computer. Cause again, I want to stay away from that stuff. Even, uh, I just want to play and I, I love that thing. And, uh, I still love that. And so because of that, when people talk about the new spark go, I'm like, I'm sure it's great, but I don't have any desire for it. Um, because the, I have not nothing. I, there's no complaints I have about that fly. So see, Pat says, I hate the fly. It's tiny sounding. So again, it's just how you use the gear. It's like, everybody's going to have a different preference of ear. I think it sounds huge. Um, and, uh, and, but it's also how, and what I'm expecting from it. You know what I mean? And I, I love it. I think it sounds fantastic. Uh, let's see. Hold on. Some of you guys are so funny. Let's see. Somebody says the fly is discontinued. Well, it's in stock at Sweetwater right now. So you can buy it. I should put a link and then I'll get paid a nickel. 
Uh, so, like I said, I have not tried. I'm looking at anything else. Yeah, uh, Nick says, uh, he's talking about what we were talking about earlier. He says digital cameras are just more convenient and practical for professional. Uh, exactly. Same thing, right? Um, Again, I don't ever argue, you know, a modeler is better than AMP or AMP is better than modeler. It's just what suits your needs as a tool. And to me, when I'm physically working, when I'm actually trying to get stuff accomplished, the modeler's just, life just moves so smooth and I get so much creation done. And the AMPs are, you know, I guess if I was, you know, if I had, you know, a, a studio engineer and he was moving my AMP and micing me up and I was some rock star, I would do it too. I'd be like, yeah, I'd have a real AMP. I'd be screw this modeling junk. Have the... Have the guy do that, but same thing, you know, right? It's like, what's why my luggage has wheels on it. And I don't know, no, 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 uh, nobody's carrying my luggage up to the room, right? Hotel, I'm, I'm dragging my own, so put it on wheels. So there you go. Um, okay, is there anything else before we go? Let's see. Uh, Cirrus says the spark go has 38 amp models. That's, that's good. Um, again, like I said, if it works, how much is it? Is it is on? Let's see if it's on here. Spark go. Oh, Sweetwater doesn't carry yet. Let's put the spark in and see what happens. So it's 229 for the spark mini. And they don't show the Spark Go because obviously it's probably not out yet to them. Maybe it's only out direct. So I don't know. Like I said, but that's the great thing about this. Not everything's for everyone. So like I said, I, I might love it. I might think it's the greatest thing ever. I might switch to it. Okay. Um... Hold on. Hmm. I had a lot of comments. I'm just look. Hold on. I'm scanning real quick if you guys don't mind. Huh. I don't know. Okay. I was looking for a question. Uh, somebody mentioned, but I scrolled and I can't find it. So, on. Um... Okay. On that note, I think we'll call it. They, um, I think we covered a lot of subjects and I think we're ready for the weekend. <laughs> uh, hope everybody's got good plans this weekend for playing some guitar and playing some music. All right. I thank you guys so much for hanging out. And as always, it was a, it was a good time. I enjoyed it. Uh, same time next week. Oh, actually, no, I don't know. So next week's show is up in the air because I do have to go inspect the Badlands uh, first batch, the 25. And so I think they want me to do it on a Saturday or a Friday or the Saturday. Um, and uh, I'm contemplating. I'll, I'll let you guys know. I'll post it up on on YouTube so I can post out to you. If you're a subscriber, you'll get notified uh, when I post, uh, uh, you know, a post, not a video. Um, I was thinking about doing it on Thursday um, and not doing it on Friday. So on Friday, I could go do the Badlands thing and inspect the guitars. So we'll see, we'll figure it out. I'll, I'll, I'll just, it, it depends on how, it really, it depends on how many of the guitars are really ready and everything's ready to go for me when I get there and do that stuff. So I'll let you guys know. Uh, and give you guys updates. I'll also make sure to update this uh, this week. I'll make sure to update the uh, Know Your Gear uh, podcast.com website if we make any changes to the show. So we'll say it's next Friday until we hear anything different. Like I said, I try not to interrupt the shows too much, but stuff like this, obviously, I'm sure these people would like, I'm sure 25 guitar players would really like me to come a day earlier and get their guitars out a little sooner, right? So that's what I have to think about, you know, as well. All right, guys, as always, I want to thank you so much for hanging out. Till next Friday. See you then.